Astronomers know of thousands of exoplanets. And when we look in the solar system, many of the planets are orbited by moons. And so the question is, do those exoplanets have exomoons? Like they must, right? Well, you can't just assume they have them. You have to actually find them. And my guest today is Dr. David Kipping. He, of course, does the Cool Worlds channel on YouTube. He leads the Cool Worlds lab at Columbia University and has been attempting to answer this question, are there exomoons? And thinks he's found a couple of candidates. Other people disagree. Now, we have a very long, very wide-ranging conversation. We spend about the first third talking about sort of the state of the art in the search for exomoons and what the future space telescopes are going to be able to do. Then we shift gears and spend a lot of time talking about the search for life in the universe and are we alone and techno signatures and all that kind of good stuff. And then for the final third, we talk a lot about like what it means to be a science communicator, how that has impacted his research and sort of how he sees people can be more effective communicators of, of science in this modern age of the internet. So it's a always a fascinating conversation. I have, you know, I really enjoy talking to David. Uh, the interview is long, but I think you'll get a lot out of it. All right, here's my interview with Dr. David Kipping. David, it's good to see you again. It's great to see you again, Fraser. Yeah, it's been a while. Do you remember the last time we hung out? I don't. You're, it, you're catching me off guard now. When was it, like two years ago? It, it was the American Astronomical Society in Hawaii. Oh, man. Yeah. Right before COVID. And oh so, yeah, and so we had like a, an interview that, that we did, um, as well as attended a bunch of, of stuff at the, at the conference. But when we were there, we could feel this impending lockdown mm. coming. It was really tangible at that point that, that life was going to change, and it sure did. Yeah, but I did really enjoy that meeting, and you know, it's a beautiful place to be. I took my family yeah. with me, and that, yeah, and then the, the world changed forever, and that that seems like a uh, you know such a strange episode of our lives that fortunately is winding down mostly now. So I'm, I'm happy that period is, <laughs> yeah. is largely gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, I got so many things I want to talk to you about, but I think the thing that's most pressing, it, let's start with exomoons. This is your research. Um, you've been caught or you, you've somehow brought me into some kind of debate that you're having with other <laughs> scientists and I'm happy to play my part. Um, <laughs> but what is, the, what is the current state of research searching for moons around planets orbiting other stars so this i mean we've been wanting to look find exomoons for like two decades like ever since you know people were thinking about kepler uh, which we launched in 2008 as soon as that was on the cards every you know people got really excited including myself about the idea of finding exomoons scan forward you know i led a project during kepler trying to look for moons and we just time after time couldn't see any earth-sized moons which is Maybe not surprising in hindsight, but I was an optimist. I kind of thought we would find plenty of those things out there. So we surveyed probably of order of sort of 300, 350 planets during our time. And only two real candidates popped up over this entire analysis. One was Kepler 1625, which really we just had the, the smallest of hints from the Kepler data that there was something there. But the planet itself was just plum for an exomoon. It was a Jupiter mass, Jupiter-sized planet on a wide orbit around its star, one of the coldest planets we had on a circular orbit. The star was quite, everything was just like, you know, if, if, any, if we're going to find anything, this is kind of the planet you'd expect to find it around. So we applied for Hubble time, we got that, and then in that Hubble data was the first real exomoon candidate that was published, Kepler 1625b. Then, kind of inspired from that, we thought, hey, maybe this idea of looking for planets around the very, very coldest and biggest Jupiter planets, which maybe is like a totally obvious thing to do, but maybe that's what we should focus on before we totally give up on Kepler. Before that, we kind of focused on things that were, I'd say, uh, 0.1, so a, a tenth of the Earth's orbit to the Earth's orbit, that kind of orbital separation, just because there's like tons of planets there, basically. We didn't find anything. So we looked further out, and that's when we got Kepler 1708b-i. And both of these moons, I think, have surprised people because they are so weird. So yes, the planets make sense. They're Jupiter's cold circular orbits. But the moons are very surprising. They're, they're mini Neptunes slash Neptunes, depending on you know how you fit the models. You get slightly different parameters. But they're, they're clearly very big. 
and not anticipated in the literature. There's no theory paper that says, I bet there's loads of these things out there. So understandably, including ourselves, we're all skeptical about this. And we have said from the very outset, look, you know, don't treat these as confirmed things. We need more data because this is clearly very surprising. And the data, you know, we're really pushing these data sets to their limits to get even these signals. So that was kind of the state of the art. And then I guess maybe your question is leading into the recent controversy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to understand, like, if you took what, like, the more interesting of these worlds of of and put it into the solar system, where would it be, and what would it sort of be in comparison to other things? Like, how would we compare to what we know? It's hard. It's hard to know. We know so little about these moons. It's difficult to know what we could compare. Um, or I even suppose the planet, if we, right? if like we tried the- to scale, yeah. So the planet itself, uh, the two planets are in different orbits. One is uh, just uh, just around an AU, Kepler sixteen twenty five is around the Earth's orbit, um, and then the other one seventeen oh eight B is a little bit further out. I think it's like one point six AU, so maybe just beyond Mars's orbit. Um, so those are our two planets, and they're both, as I said, like Jupiter mass. We actually do have a mass now for Kepler 1625b that looks like it's about two or three Jupiter masses. It's not yet published, but uh, it, it certainly looks exactly what we'd expect. Uh, given the early analysis we did for the moon analysis, we kind of guessed a, a mass for the planet, and it all kind of lines up. The moons itself, what do we know about them? So we know their size. Uh, for Kepler 1625b, we also have a mass on the moon because the planet wobbles. We do not. We do not have that for the second object. We only have a radius, and that's because from Kepler, the, the period of this of the second guy, Kepler seventeen oh eight b dash i. I'm sorry for the numbers. That it's so long. It's over a thousand days. So in the four years Kepler looked at it, there's only two transits. And if you want to see a wobble, you need at least three. You can't do it with two because you could always just draw a straight line through two points. So you just can't look for a wobble through those two. So we have no idea if the planet is wobbling, and therefore we can't tell if there's a mass a mass signal in there. But presumably, it does have a mass if it's real. But so we don't know. But you, it's. I mean, that's pretty much a year, probably, for you to make to do your observations, right? Like once a year, you sec- can take a second- shot. Yeah, so the Kepler 625b is about a year. It's 287 days, it's period. Uh, so it's just interior to an AU, I think. Whereas the other one, 1708b, is beyond that. It's at 1.6 AU, 1.7 AU. And that's that. It, its period is um, 1,078 days. So, way, you know, like three years. So that's why we only have two transits of that thing in the four-year period, unfortunately. I wish we had more, but that's all we've got. Um, what's interesting is with the moons, I guess 1625b-i, the, the, the moon to planet mass ratio is about 1%, and the radius ratio is about 40%, and that's basically identical to our own moon. And also the semi-major axis is not too far off the semi-major axis of the moon. So the semi-major axis, I think, is about 40 or 50 planetary radii, whereas the moon is at 60. So if you measure distance in terms of dimensions of the planet, then they're actually almost identical in terms of their separation. Now, I wouldn't claim that means this thing formed the same way, but it, if you literally just multiplied that system by like a factor of uh, 10 or something, you get this, the Earth-Moon system X10 produces Kepler 1625 b-i, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then for the other guy, it's actually a very different moon. It's, um, it's smaller. But it's much, much closer in, and it's on pretty much the same orbit that Europa has around Jupiter. So very close in moon. Uh, the four Galilean moons are all what I would consider very close in compared to the sort of scales that we normally look at, whereas the moon's far out. Um, and so that's kind of uh, interesting from a from a disk formation perspective or something, like maybe it, it really was born there and lived out its whole life there. So that's all really all, all we have to work with, with the with the Kepler data. And that's, of course, why we would love to have more observations of these things. Now, do you know the next transit dates? Like, do you have these on a calendar somewhere? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's public yeah. information. You can, you can just look up yeah. the next ephemeris. Obviously, they don't transit too often. And um, to be totally honest with you, we have not been uh, scheduling any mm. observations to go after these. Because probably some of the reasons we'll get into yes, of the, yeah. these objects have, I guess the short answer is these objects have become controversial and it's not that I don't want to continue to observe them. I would love to continue to observe them, but frankly, it's just 
politically impossible to observe them because there's so much controversy stirred around them, um, including, you know, there's even been specific comments saying these objects should not be observed again. It's a waste of telescope time that uh, telescope allocation committees just uh, just shooting us down. And we, we've tried and it's there's wow. no appetite for even going after these. So we've this- kind of given up on trying this just to got spicy. Them. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, like we had reported, I actually covered it in space bites that, uh, that there was, uh, you know, some challenges to the theory that you were putting out that, that these are exomoons. What is the exomoon candidates? Exomoon that's, candidates. That's claim. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting things that maybe people should look at again someday. Um, what is the sort of the counter argument to, to what you're saying? So there's been, I mean, there's been several. So I mean, that's worth keeping in mind, right? I'm I'm one voice, and there, there have been, uh, I think, three or four or five papers now, which do not like these moons in, in either one, um, especially in sixty, the first one, sixteen twenty five. But almost all of them come from one author, I should say. So there's there's only really two two right. independent analyses of the data. Um, actually, so uh, in the uh, in the first uh, in the first for the first XA moon, there was two independent analyses that came out. And in one of those, um, the XA moon signal was actually recovered in, in the Hubble data. This is the Hubble telescope data, remember, not Kepler data that we claimed the XA moon was in. So they got the same signal as us. They just didn't really believe it. They just sort of said, I see this, but I'm just suspicious about the fits. And honestly, I didn't quite understand the argument as to why they didn't believe it. But it's in their data and they recovered it and you can see they fit it. And then the second one, um, they actually did their own independent reduction and they do get the moon, but a much, much, much smaller moon to the degree that you probably wouldn't really believe it if you, if you, if I saw it or anyone reasonably saw it. So that was suspicious. Uh, we did reanalyze that, that paper. We've, re- re- you know, obviously replied to both of these. We think the case where they get a much smaller moon, we were able to show in their data analysis. I mean, this is really getting into the weeds a bit, but we were able to show that they get much larger errors and systematics than us. And uh, the second, the second one, I guess we can open up that can of worms. But yeah, there was uh, they criticized both moons actually recently in a Nature paper, and that's when we've been inter- you know interacting recently about it. And uh, that's a whole that's a whole other thing as well. And I I just want to say I wish I wish uh, I wasn't dragged. You know, it's obviously unfortunate that the whole field's been made this controversial. And I. I wish we could just talk to each other. I just, I mm. really do wish these authors would have just like corresponded with me ahead of time and we could have just like figured it out. It's, it's weird yeah. to have to have this dialogue like this. But I, but I think, well, I, I mean, I hope that, that this isn't going to be part of the dialogue. Um, you know, that's definitely not my job. Um, but, but it, but it feels to me like, like whenever you're really at the, at the absolute limits of what the current telescopes can do, then these are the kinds of conversations that people are going to have. When you look at what happened with the initial measurements mm-hmm. of atmospheres, thanks to Spitzer and even the Hubble Space Telescope, these were the kinds of conversations that people were having. I remember all the back and forths with like, we detected this in the atmosphere. No, you didn't. And then James Webb comes along and the results are unambiguous. There's just these clear signals yeah. of carbon dioxide, of water vapor, of methane in the atmospheres. And now the argument is about, you know, did we did you detect fainter gases that mm. are, you know, maybe associated with, with life. I mean, this doesn't seem surprising to me that this is the, this is where, you know, whatever is the absolute limit, whenever someone is attempting to push the telescopes as far as they can possibly go, this is what you get. And so. Yeah, it, I totally it, agree. It's, 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 um, we are pushing these telescopes really hard and we've, but the, the nice thing is, you know, we think, we have these kinds of tests where we can, you know, inject and recover signals and ask, well, you know, given the data quality, how often do we expect to be tricked by the data? And so, for instance, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited about, um, especially the second candidate we released, was that we were able to make that calculation and it was a 1% false alarm rate. So that's that's actually at the level that we normally consider a planet to be legit validated. Uh, if normally uh, when we take a transit of an exoplanet, you can't really tell if it's really a planet. It could be maybe just two stars eclipsing one another or something in a weird way. And so we run all these models, we test them. And if the probability is greater than 99% or 
or I should say the false alarm rate is less than 1%. It's probably the more rigorous way of saying that. Then we say, look, we're done. This is a real planet. Stick it on the catalog. We're done with. And that was the rate, that was the probability we got for this exomoon. So when we saw that, we still didn't call it a confirmed exomoon, but we we felt like we had a really good candidate here. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously... Um, frustrating that another team has looked at this and uh, not got the same answer as us. But I think, as my uh, recent paper has addressed, I think we understand why that happened. Right. But but this, I mean, there's only so far you can go with this data. I mean, I think the answer is someone needs to give you time on James Webb. Right. So we can talk about so, James Webb. So we... Yeah. I mean, I just want to talk about like what what out there can take these observations to the next level. Yeah, I mean, JWST is definitely the 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 best we have in precision. So that's what you want to use. What's actually remarkable about JWST, um, I have a grad student, uh, Ben Cassess, who's been doing a lot of calculations on this during his last year of his project here. And what we found is that if you take all the known 5,000 plus exoplanets and you take the current models that we use in the solar system for moon formation, so the models that we make the Jupiter moons, the Saturn moons, the Neptune moons, even our own moon. You take those models and you create moons around all of the different planets. So often these moons are extremely small, as you can imagine, because the moons in the solar system are pretty small. And then you ask how many of them would survive for 5 billion years, given the dynamics and stability and tidal interactions, all this kind of stuff. Obviously not very many do. And then you ask how many of those would actually be detectable with different telescopes. And we tried this with Kepler. We tried this with Hubble, and then we tried this with JWST. And we try actually for every single instrument, every way you can use JWST, we tried it. And we use a simulator, obviously, to do this. We literally get a telescope and, and try 5,000 planets at once. I don't think they'd quite give us that much time. But uh, we tried it in a simulator, and we found that um, only JWST, only JWST could detect the moons in the solar system. There is, if you look at HST, the number of moons that come out is zero. There is not a single solar system-like moon that would plausibly form, persist, and be detectable with Hubble around any of the 5,000 exoplanets we know about. And obviously that's true of Kepler as well. So therefore, maybe if that's the kind of moons that the universe makes, it is not surprising that we did not find any of those moons with Kepler. Um, but with JWST, the number was 27. 27 so we were, moons total? There was 27 exoplanets, which right. should form solar system-like moons, they should persist, and they should be detectable with JWST. Now, that's not hundreds, but that's kind of the point. You've, you've, just, tipped, right. you've just tipped over the threshold where suddenly these things absolutely should be detectable for the first time. And like you have a list. Yes. And you have a, like a top – so tell me, what's your top candidate – uh, we we applied for three in the last cycle. I think our number one is probably a planet. I'll give you the the, the target. It's Kepler one sixty seven e, and it's actually a planet that I discovered. So I'm kind of happy it <laughs> ended up being that one. Um, but it's a planet I discovered uh, like probably almost ten years ago, and it is a Jupiter analog by by all in, all descriptions. So it's a very long period. Um, I can't remember the exact period, but it's a, a Jupiter. It's around a Jupiter mass. Its mass has been measured now. In fact, it's, I think its mass is 1.01 Jupiter masses plus or minus like 0.02. So it's like almost exactly Jupiter mass. It's pretty much exactly Jupiter radius. We know, we've got its orbit nailed down, and uh, it's got it's in a multi-planet system. There's four other planets, inner planets in that system as well. So it really is like the solar system, and that it, it's very it's around a pretty bright star. And with JWST, we calculate a 90% recovery rate of Galilean moons. Uh, so if you take the Galilean moon system and you inject it around this planet, and then you do a blind recovery in the JWST data set, more than 90% of those experiments, we would successfully get a strong detection. More than five sigma, that was our threshold. Can you explain that the, word recovery? How, like, I don't understand what you mean by recovery. So yeah, this is, maybe I'm using kind of the, the parlance of proposal speak a little bit here, but when we do this, what we do is we take um, a simulation of this exoplanet's transit 
And we obviously match that to the parameters that have previously been found. And then we just add on the full Galilean moon system. So we add on Io, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede. We add those four moons. We keep them in the Laplacian resonance. Everything's just, just as it really is. And then we uh, simulate what the noise properties of JWST would be. And we get this noisy light curve as you would really observe it. And then we put it through our algorithms and ask, you know, look for a moon. What do you see? And over 90% of the time, they successfully recover at least one of those exomoons in that system. Not all four. To get all four is probably never going to happen with JWST, especially IO. It, IO is really small and it's really close in. We basically never get IO. But um, for Ganymede and Callisto, the outer two, we get those over 90% of the time. They really drive the signal, those two. So What's exciting, I think, about this planet, and we have actually another one just like that. I said we proposed for three. Two of them were gas giants, just like that. And then another one was an Earth, a super Earth, that was pretty much as close to the Earth as we can find in the Kepler catalog. Um, and then of those three, uh, we think we have a really excellent chance that um, we could test satellite formation theory for the first time. Because if we don't find this moon, that's telling us something profound. It's telling us that Jupiter, Jupiter's forming Jupiter-like moons is not inevitable, which we currently understand to be the case. Right, right. I mean, we have so many examples here in the solar system. I mean, they're different, but Titan around Saturn, the the large moons around Neptune, tr I mean, Triton, I don't think you can really classify that. It's so weird. Mm, but the, yeah. lar the other large moons around Neptune, the other large moons around Uranus, like there, like there really seems to be this this mass ratio for moons compared to to planets but that's not i mean you're talking about the galilean moons you're not talking about the the neptune sized moon orbiting a jupiter sized planet like would those sort of more extreme cases be a lot more interesting and surprising as opposed to oh, yeah. oh we oh, we found out we're normal no no we found yeah. weird stuff I agree. I mean, this is where the kind of the strategy and the politics comes in a little bit. So because there there has been controversy about uh, two Neptune-sized moons, um, we, we we just, my feeling was that, you know, if we put in a telescope proposal, time, we've done it before several times, we've asked for time on these and it's been shot down. So, and they're not just shot down, they're ranked like absolute bottom of the pile mm. over and over again. So to us, the feeling was, just don't even bother applying right. at this point. I see. <laughs> so so <laughs> we felt to convince the community that exomoons was not a um, a waste of time as a field, that we had to deliver moons that people were comfortable with. And, <laughs> and, and you know, the the to get rid of that knee-jerk allergic reaction mm. to to having such a strange moon. And that's kind of what happened with exoplanets. I mean, with exoplanets, no one believed the pulsar planets, right? They're just like, who... Yeah. Who made those? Like that's not possible. And then even or the hot, hot Jupiters, Jupiters right. there was skepticism about. And it Super took a Earths, while. It mini took a long time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like the, the weird stuff, the weird exoplanets that keep coming up show you that the universe is creative and coming up with things that astronomers didn't even think was was possible. Yeah. And and but I but but that strategy is very interesting to me that you that you're like okay fine we're going to look for a Jupiter analog. And here's a list of really nice Jupiter analogs. And I think when you when you match this to the discovery of the rogue Jupiter-sized rogue planets in, say, the Orion Nebula, like there's a lot of capability from JWST to observe objects of this size, hopefully at that distance from the star. Yeah, I I, I do say this on the strategy. We JWST time, I have the utmost respect for how precious it is. Yeah. And I do not want to waste JWST time. And I would, I, I'm not sure I would feel comfortable doing a fishing expedition with JWST, given the enormous taxpayer resources people have spent on this telescope. So I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't want to use JWST in that way. And we are, we are absolutely not going to use it in that way in this proposal. So as I said, if we don't find an exomoon and it's a Neptune-sized moon around these planets, it doesn't really teach us anything. It doesn't fundamentally, it doesn't prove that Neptune-sized moons don't exist. Doesn't It doesn't really advance us too much, except for maybe we made a mistake before, and that's about it. Whereas if we don't find moons around this Jupiter-sized planet, that is going to be our first exo data point on, on moon formation in terms of uh, anchoring our own ideas of how moons should form in the solar system. So I really feel like it it is a much more useful data point either way. 
successful or failure. And what's really cool is because the signal to noise, I mean, we are going after a much brighter planet, much brighter stars than, than the Kepler planets typically are. Um, that means we can do all this extraordinary extra science. So one really cool thing I want to advertise is that we can measure the ablateness of this planet to 13 sigma if it had a Jupiter-like ablateness. So Jupiter's barely ablate. You know, you probably know Saturn is a little bit ablate. It's like point, it's it's 10% wider than it is yeah, um, squished. high. Yeah, it's, right. it's been squashed out, squished, stretched yeah. out a little bit at the, at, the, at the equator and squashed at the poles. And that's also true for Jupiter. And this is just centrifugal spin, essentially what causes this. It's a little bit less for Jupiter. It's about 5%. But even if this planet had the same ablateness as Jupiter, which, by the way, it really should do because it's exactly the same mass as Jupiter. It's 1.01 Jupiter masses. Then... And it's in a wide orbit. It's definitely not tidally locked. It's way, way beyond tidal locking. It should have its primordial spin. It should be like 10 hours or something. Then we could detect that to 13 sigma. That's And that'd be the first ever time we've measured the ablateness of an exoplanet, by the way. That would teach us about its rotation rate. It could even measure the obliquity from this measurement. Um, it would obviously, if we found an exomoon around at the same time, there might be an, a misalignment or an alignment. That would be incredibly fascinating. We can even get rings. So this, there's... It, like, so lead with that. Planet, we did. We did. We, <laughs> okay, we, good, we thought good. carefully. We thought yeah. carefully about how to craft this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, you know, a, a, a method, methodology for measuring the, uh, you know, the... Ob was it the obliqueness? Ablateness. Uh, ablateness. Ablateness. Yeah, yeah ablateness um, of an exoplanet, of a Jupiter mass exoplanet around another star. Yeah, that that sounds pretty compelling to me, and I'm sure it's interesting to the to the steering committee. Yeah, I mean, we and we have a student here, Justin Vega, whose project is all about ablateness. It is a completely under-realized potential in exoplanets because um, the vast majority of exoplanets we've had thus far have either been too close to the star, so they're tightly locked, if they're tightly locked, they're spinning very slowly and this you don't get this centrifugal bulging. Or they're around a star which is just too dim or too, you know, the data quality is just not good enough to see that ablateness. And JWST basically solves those problems for you because now we have a catalog of long period planets from Kepler, but we can get the precision that we need from JWST. And so there really is uh, the opportunity to build out a catalog of rotation periods and ablatenesses and, and obl obliquity measurements for exoplanets. There's like three new dimensions that we can add on to our to our parameters. For oh, the first that's time. really interesting. Yeah, I mean, like we know the radius, we know the mass, we know the orbit, and now JWST is starting to reveal the atmospheric constituents, and of course, Ariel is yeah. going to be coming in 2028, and that's going to give us atmospheres on on more than a thousand exoplanets but you're right there's this whole other set of parameters that the you know what is the oblateness of kepler you know k218b i don't know right yeah yeah but suddenly and that teaches you so much about the interior as well you can learn about the size of the core and you know you can learn about the the history of the planet like look at venus it's like spinning extremely slowly which really implies it had like a giant merger or impact in its past at some point um you look at uranus and it's been tilted over so it's obliquity is completely over so you get this like incredible insight into the origin and the story of where these worlds really come from that we just do not have access to right now so i you know I, I'm not. I, I'm not saying uh, the moon is not interesting, but I think this is right up there. And we we definitely tried to sell that as like this is this is a slam dunk, guys. We're going to test satellite formation theory, and we're going to deliver a 13 sigma, which is huge measurement of the first ablateness signal. I, I can just imagine the you know, steering committee like Dr. Kipping. Won't this also tell you if the place has moons? And you're like, whatever. I don't care. Like I just want to know if it's squished or not. Um, now, I mean, when you think about like how you could potentially do other kinds of observations, like say when the square kilometer array comes online, you could potentially search for say a magnetosphere around mm. a world like that, and and you know what is the potential of an interactions between a planet like that and its magnetosphere and the moons orbiting around it because there is the interactions here in the solar system. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, and and it could be that you, you know there could be one Jupiter analog planet that could be chosen to study at this deep depth that could give you some of these characteristics and compare it to the solar system. Um, now, next 
the next tool that's coming online is going to be the Nancy Grace Rowan telescope. It's equipped with a coronagraph. Mm. It's going to be able to distinguish planetary brightness to a factor of 100 million. It's going to be able to pick out, oh, I don't know, Jupiter-sized worlds around sun-like stars. Mm. Have you been thinking about how you might, you know, if you can't get James Webb time, maybe you can get time on Nancy Grace Rowan? Yeah, I mean, the the interesting thing about looking for exomoons is that there's so many ways you can do it. And we have been talking so far, and my team mostly focuses on transits, but now we're kind of switching gears with Roman, I guess, and you could think about imaging. But Roman's not even just doing imaging, as you probably know. It's also, it does do a lot of transits as well. It's also doing um, microlensing, which is a, a kind of a, a, a technique we don't talk about too often in exoplanet hunting. It makes up maybe a um, 100 or so of the known exoplanets out of the 5,000. But they're really interesting worlds, and it's discovering like rogue planets and extremely widely separated cold planets and things like this. And I think um, I would put my money on microlensing as being the more likely method by which Roman could deliver an exomoon, especially if it was a free-floating planet. So you can imagine a free-floating planet with a widely separated moon. As that happens to go across the galactic bulge and you know get lensed a little bit by some bright background source, the lensing of that light around the exomoon will cause a little extra brightening feature that we can look for. And um, that is a little bit uh, you know, virgin territory. Like we really don't understand too well the detectability of exomoons with microlensing. There's been some studies, but certainly not for Roman specifically. Nor indeed do we understand how easy is it to discriminate between that solution versus say, maybe it's just um, a star with a small planet that we've got the distance wrong. And then that kind of changes the scale of everything. And so there's a lot of degeneracies that I think we're wrestling with. Um, but it will probably deliver hundreds, if not thousands, of these types of events. And then maybe the exomoon detections will be more statistical. Maybe we'll say, you know, we think 70% of those are exomoons. We're just not sure exactly which, which 7 out of 10 it is. But I think we'll get really strong constraints on the population of exomoons from Roman. So but you would prefer, dog- like, microlensing statistical microlensing information over, say, direct imaging of Jupiter-sized exoplanets around other stars? Well, it's not either or, right? We get both. Well, I understand. Um, yeah. And I, th- I think the challenge with imaging is, yes, you've got this beautiful chronograph that can basically resolve the star and delete the star to some degree by a factor of 100 million and give you the planet light, but that doesn't resolve the moonlight from the planet. Now, they're still mm. mixed up together. So the question is, how do you get the moon out of that blob of? I mean, we talk about like a pale blue dot, you know, when we think about Carl Sagan in our in our ears talking about this image. But really, the pale blue dot is a pale blue gray dot because the moon's light is completely mixed up in there, and it, especially for these chronographs, there's no way to resolve them. So that you know, how do you detect an exomoon? And people are thinking about that, but we don't really have a good answer. And I don't think Roman has any instrumentation that could answer could could do that. One idea would be if you had a spectrograph, a very high resolution spectrograph in space, you could do basically radio velocity. So the same way we look at stars and we see them wobbling back and forth, back and forth, because there's a companion, a planet around it, that causes the spectral lines to shift left, right, left, right, blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift. If we could do that same thing for the imaged planet, we could we could detect the moon around it that way which is a really clever idea, but Roman does not have a high resolution spectrograph on board for those imaging experiments. So that's, it's just not something that's accessible for that experiment. Um, another idea would be, uh, maybe you might see transits if you're very lucky. Um, but the problem with that is of course, you have to have just the right geometry. The moon has to kind of just a cool, just the right way. So you'd have to have probably of order of a hundred or so of those things. You have to have not just a single image, but lots of time series images, right? Kepler didn't just take one photo of each star and then move on somewhere else. It stared at the same stars for four years and took photo after photo after photo after photo after photo after photo. And Roman's not going to do that in its imaging. It's not going to stare at things for um, years at a time. So when it, however you slice it, it's it's kind of like a bonus science, I think, the chronograph imaging. And certainly for exomoons, I think it's really pushing it. I don't think anyone had exomoons in mind when they thought about what Roman would be doing. Like once again, we're back to the very limits of what these telescopes could possibly do. And there lies the inconclusive results and their 
comes the arguments um, with your colleagues. Yeah. Um, what about astrometry? So astrometry is an interesting idea for looking for, for planets. That's actually not really delivered too many planets yet, which has always been kind of its historical We're hangover. waiting for release four. So, yeah, you know, be yeah, patient. That's the promise. It's like fusion. Yeah. It's like, it's like, just, <laughs> it's just wait. Like, just wait for, yeah. right, for, coming. for DR4. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. So I do have faith that we'll get them with DR4, actually. But uh, it's, it's been a long time coming. But the problem is for exomoons, it's just not, not going to work. Uh, you're measuring the position of a star. And how is a star going to feel the presence of an exomoon? The only thing it can do is respond gravitationally in terms of its position. But if you take, you know, Jupiter and its moons, and you take the sun, and you consider how does the sun wobble, and you added all those moons together on top of Jupiter, it would be the same signal. They're identical. Right. Right. There's no right. difference in the signal. The average so out. The, yeah. Yeah. There is I mean maybe I'm slightly I'm, I'm slightly over exaggerating there. There is a very 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 tiny residual, but it's of order I know for rate of velocity technique, it's of order of an, a, a micrometer per second. That's the residual. Right. So people people have thought about this, but probably the only place it works is pulsar timing because they are the only people which have access to the extraordinary precision that you need to be able to possibly do that experiment and even then they're only sensitive to mass ratios of order of about 5%, I think, which is really, really big moon. At that, at but that if you point. get your like hot Jupiter that is being orbited by a hot Saturn really close to the star, like is there a way to push these systems to the extreme that you could actually start to see some kind of weird double wobble on the star? I don't think so. So yeah. that number I gave you of micrometers per second, uh, this is from a paper by Crayer and Murray in, I think, 2010. Uh, they found that micrometers per second corresponded to a Jupiter-Jupiter twin. <laughs> so they already, <laughs> okay, they already well, like okay. maxed this out quite a lot right. in terms of like how big this signal could be. And then, you know, with astrometry, astrometry is notoriously less sensitive to planets than rate of velocity. So I don't think it's going to be any better on the on the astrometry side of things. And as I said, I do know the pulsar timing people. When you do pulsar timing, you are essentially doing astrometry on on the pulsar. And in those cases, I think it was uh, Sackett, Penny Sackett and Karen Lewis wrote a series of papers in the late 90s, actually. And they showed that the, the mass ratios were just not that useful. But and I really wish someone would do the experiment with pulsar timing because there are pulsar planets. It'd be cool to see what you know limits you could put. But um, I think for astrometry with Gaia, just is not going to happen. No exomoons that way. Right. All right. So if if all goes well, and after you've gotten the sort of the the bump from this channel, uh, you'll get time on JWST to make observations of this prime exoplanet, this Jupiter-sized exoplanet, you know, to discover how much of an oblate spheroid it is and whatever other data seems to come your way. Um, what would be the ideal time to make that observation? There's only, I mean, with these planets, they transit so rarely that mm -hmm. there's really just one shot. In fact, this, you know, the this one of the objects I told you about transits once every 1,078 days. So three years, you have to wait. Uh, you have to wait. You know, you're not going to get it in cycle one. You're not going to get in cycle two of JWST time. You have to get cycle three. Otherwise, you wait until cycle six. So we don't really have a lot of flexibility. I think the thing that hurts us with these exoplanets and why I think the TAC will be a little bit concerned is because we ask for so much time. Uh, and that's just unavoidable. So normally when you look at a hot Jupiter, because the planet is so close to the star, it transits in a matter of like two or three hours and you're done. Now for these long period planets on years, orbital periods, it takes like a whole day, 24 hours for the planet just to go in front of the star. And then Around that, you need to have the hill sphere, which is the region where the satellites and the moons could live. So this ends up being like a 50-hour request, which is not unprecedented, but it's at the very, very like mm. high end of what committees would normally feel comfortable giving us. Right. To give you 50 hours on JWST is a big ask. Yes. Yeah. But I it's understand. it's a there's no other way of doing it. If you want, you know. If you want to find moons around cold planets, you're just going to have to put in the time. You know, there's no, there's no two yeah. ways about that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think I think we got the exomoons out of our system. Uh, let's let's shift some gears now because on this is like a teeny tiny fraction of the things that you talk about. It's, it seems to be like the it seems to live rent free in your brain, but 
uh, but there's a lot of other stuff that you're that you're thinking about. Um, you're so heavily involved in the sort of techno signature SETI community. Mm. Um, what's sort of the what's the news from that front? How you know how how are we thinking about the search for life, uh, intelligent life, especially beyond Earth? It's very diverse. There's, and I think that is kind of the strength at the moment that we are, you know, when you think about classical SETI back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, it was pretty much all radio centric. And I think the strength of what's been happening increasingly in this field is the destigmatization of it and the ability for scientists to put out their new and innovative ideas and strategies for how to conduct these searches, and even actually in many cases implementing those searches. So you have, you know, things like um, the the Dyson spheres with this, you know, infrared excess that we would expect from them, because any just by the laws of thermodynamics, unless aliens can avoid thermodynamics, which we think is like, if any law is going to hold, it should be thermodynamics. Um, as long as they don't violate that, these things should be infrared bright. And so we've been, for example, running searches to look for those things. And they've been bringing up candidates, actually. Candidate potential Dyson spheres. It, candidate infra, infrared I mean, yeah, signatures. Essentially. essentially. Yeah. I, don't, I feel a little bit uh, <laughs> cautious because I don't want to have the headline be like Dyson, <laughs> Dyson sphere candidates detected. But that, there, were, yeah. you know, there have been surveys. I was listening to a great talk just yesterday. Um, and they, they, I think there was like a order of, uh, 10 candidates from about a few thousand, uh, stars that they looked at. Um, and they don't yet understand what they are. They're probably going to turn out to be something spurious, but it, it's kind of reflective of the fact we are, we are broadening out all the different strategies we are thinking about. For me personally, I've been thinking a lot about, um, false positives and, um, especially in the era of like UFOs and UAPs. It seems, you know, like scientists often have a knee-jerk reaction to sort of saying, well, you know, just ignore the UAPs and UFOs and stuff like that. But I think ideally we would want to have a total uniform framework where it could be anything from fossils on Mars to a biosignature to a tetanus signature to a UFO, whatever it is. And all of that could be interpreted in a self-consistent way without, without prejudice or bias because we're not really, you know, we don't want to be throwing stuff out just because X said this and I don't like X who said that. So we're trying to, uh, at least in, in, in my group and in my thinking, trying to produce a more objective way of, of ingesting all of these different types of information. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it objectively and say, would a giant spaceship appearing above New York City, um, be evidence of an intelligent civilization? The answer is yes, that would be mm -hmm. evidence. Um, or a spaceship that's landed in a cornfield or whatever. Um, those are all would absolutely be the, the best evidence that humanity has ever found for evidence yeah. of, of intelligent civilization. So you can't discount it. But at the same time, the, the whole field has been so muddied by blurry photos, people rushing to conclusions, and then like this, I don't know if it's an like arms race or whatever, but you get like people being skeptical, people being more and more kind of vociferous about what it is that they're finding, people being even more skeptical. And it's not, it doesn't feel productive. Hmm. Yeah. And it could be. I think it could be. Um, it's actually, I mean, in many ways, it's really not that different the the way that we search for life in a biosignature search and the concerns you might have you know if you read a headline saying phosphine like phosphine with venus you read that headline and, you, and someone might claim that's evidence of life and you might have reservations about that and the reservations would be well what if it's a false positive basically it would be you know how do you really know a phosphine was truly discovered and then second how do you truly know that phosphine equates to life you know those would be the two obvious questions you might ask just as an example, but I think that's generally true of any life detection. Um, and the same thing you could ask equally about UFOs. If you know, for a pilot sees a UFO, how much do you believe that the pilot really did see a UFO? And then second, if they did see that UFO, does that equate to aliens? It's the same. It's exactly the same chain of logic. The real challenge in all in all of those extremes is that false positive rate. I think and. 
you know, a searching for aliens is kind of unique. And I wrote about this in my last paper in that it has three qualities that I don't think any other scientific hypothesis has, um, or at least I can't think of any. One is that it can explain anything. So whenever you see something you've never seen before, be it the first pulsar, be it, you know, a fast radio burst, be it um, Oumuamua, it's easy when you see something you've never seen before to say aliens did that because how else can you explain that? Because there's no pre, there's no pre-existing expectation of it. And so it's kind of like a God of the gaps, which is what we used to do in ancient times. Every time you saw something you didn't understand, if you believed in God or you believed in aliens, in this case, you just inject that because <laughs> it, because it has magical abilities and unbounded abilities. So that's kind of one unique aspect of the alien hypothesis that I don't think too many scientific hypotheses feature. And the second was it, it can evade everything. So, you know, you might see a uh, UFO on Monday and Tuesday, and then so I go to see it with you on Wednesday, but I don't see it. And you could say, well, you know, he was just shy on Wednesday. You know, there's a, you could come up with some contrived reason always as to why the next experiment wouldn't report it. And so that makes it very difficult to make predictable, testable uh, verification of the hypothesis. And then similarly, pushing it to a harder science cycle like with Mars, you could say, Here's my claim, Mars has no life. But it's almost unfalsifiable, because how do you know there's not life hiding underneath a rock somewhere you've not looked or deep underneath the surface? So it, this unbounded avoidance capacity, as I call it in the paper, is also kind of unique. And so maybe the last pillar you might try is let's just look for stuff which is outside of known physics or outside of known understanding of biology, whatever it is, uh, impossible things, essentially miracles, miracle searching. But then of course the problem is, as we, as I alluded to at the beginning there, that the miracle could just be something that is, you know, you've yet to discover. It could just be a natural thing as pulsars were. And pulsars were first found, I think, you know, they're called LGM1, little green man one kind of playfully for a little bit. Um, but that kind of proves the point that you could, you could explain pulsars with aliens at that time and it would be a viable hypothesis. Um, and so how do you look for something where the false positive rate is essentially unquantifiable? And that's the whole problem. And, and most experiments you can do injection recovery, like we talked about with the exomoons, and you can figure out what is my false positive rate. And I just have deep worries about how do we even quantify false positive rates. If we detect a biosignature on K218b, an exoplanet, and you say, look, you know, here's DMS, DMS, dimethyl sulfide, it can only be made by life. But then next week it turns out, uh, someone says, oh, actually, I found out a way to make that without life. You just have this weird, uh, you know, chemistry happening in the deep atmosphere and it, it swells up this stuff. So the problem is there's, it, it's, the un, it's the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld would say, that really hurt us in this search for life. And so I've been thinking really hard about that because I think it's um, kind of, to be honest, like the big issue when it comes to this whole problem. And so when you say like a false positive, somebody sees something that they can't explain they immediately go to an explanation that is the god of the gaps that is well aliens did it and and for scientists that's the wrong way to propose evidence of your hypothesis is to say i can't explain it any other way so it must be like that is I, not I a think, scientific argument i think that I think. logic could be fine if your knowledge was complete. So if we knew yes. about every physical process in the universe, and that could be true in some domains. So maybe uh, within the domains of celestial mechanics, we might feel like we have basically total understanding at this point of celestial mechanics. And there's no way a planet should ever go in orbit and then just suddenly go up. And we just, we feel extremely confident that our understanding excludes that as a physical, as a natural possibility. So there may be domains where we feel confident and then we could use that kind of Sherlock Holmes deduction style method where anything that's, you know, if it's not natural, then it must therefore ergo be aliens. But in general, that's not true. I think for the vast majority of science, there are huge gaps and huge unknowns. And at the end of the day, how do you, how do we ever truly know that our celestial mechanics is complete? Because there could always be, you know, like with GR, as we discovered with Mercury's orbit, there could always be something around the corner that just is beyond our knowledge. And so this is just kind of a a really almost like a philosophical problem in terms of the the approach to science like how do we look for something that we've never seen before one of the i mean 
and I apologize, I'm going to probably sort of misrepresent your theory, but you had a really interesting video a couple of years ago where you were sort of like once again sort of philosophizing about whether or not there's life in the universe. And just the the fact that we don't know almost felt like evidence to you of sort of how much of it there is out there. Am I, am I getting that right? That you were sort of thinking about it from a Bayesian perspective about just like what we haven't found so far. Um, and, and one of the things that I sort of think about, like when we're on earth, you know, you, there is always a spider within a couple of feet of you, no matter where you mm-hmm. are pretty much. Like maybe you go to Antarctica and you're not going to get, the, but there could very well be spiders on Antarctica. I don't know. <laughs> and and so we look around us on this planet and we see the result of a planet that has been completely colonized to every extent possible by life. And now mm. we're in the process of doing that with our own technology. And is this sort of inevitable path that we are on? And when we think about how old the universe is and how much other civilizations could have gotten started billions of years before us, there's no, it doesn't violate the laws of physics to go from star to star. If Oumuamua can do it, then, mm. then in theory, a, a smart spacecraft can do it. And so it, it feels like when we look out into the universe, it feels like we're living in a wilderness. Yeah. That that we are that the same feeling that you might get when you sh- you know when the first people walked over from Siberia into North America and they were just like yeah. I don't see any people here this is it's just trees and it's mammoths and and this is unclaimed wilderness right now it feels like the universe you know maybe if there have been some examples of of Dyson spheres that's amazing but it feels like a- civilizations that have been at it for billions of years ahead of us would have been up to more and it would be just so obvious. And the fact that it's not obvious, does that give us some constraints about to think about what kind of a universe we do find ourselves in? Yeah. Yeah. So this was kind of my, uh, you know, think about it was kind of dancing around the Fermi paradox a little bit here. You know, why, why don't we see evidence for whatever, you know, colonization, basic, whatever it is you want to put in there. But yeah, it certainly seems like the galaxy and the universe more broadly are wholly consistent with a natural, a fully natural understanding. I always like to emphasize that. As far as we know, everything in the universe is consistent with just us. There's nothing about the universe that requires anything else, which is kind of amazing when you think it's and terrifying when you think about so, that. So what do you mean there? Can you sort of explain that more deeply? What do you mean like it's consistent with just us? Like like if we're the only people in the universe, it's consistent. We, we don't see engineered stars. Yes. You know, and, we, and we don't see engineered galaxies. We don't see, um, you know, some huge piece of megastructure around Sagittarius A star or around Messi 87 when we photographed it. It seems like every experiment we've ever done and every time we've looked out, it, we see a natural universe to our understanding. I mean, maybe you might get into sort of conspiracy theory territory and say, well, you know, it's all a contrivance and everything we're seeing is sort of a manipulation. But I think, as, you know, to the to first order, it appears that the universe is totally natural. So my kind of thinking on this um, is, is that we need to do, it's an argument for extra galactic searches. So let's say, let's say you're right. And that, you know, a civilization or I don't even want to use the word civilization because they could be so different to us, but some technological species does have the tendency to eventually saturate their environment, their galaxy, and it, you know just take over everything, turn all the planets into computers, whatever it is. Now, if that were true, we necessarily couldn't live in that galaxy because there'd be no habitable planets left or no, n- no planets you know, that just naturally, uh, spontaneously formed life in the way we did because everything would have been essentially transmuted at this point. So the fact we don't live in such a galaxy is not necessarily as an interesting data point as we often like to think it is. It's a necessity. It's kind of the same way I think about the early start to life. We often say the early start to life is interesting. It proves that life starts easily. And I say, well, not necessarily. If it takes four billion years for evolution to get to us, then there's only like another billion years left on the clock, by the way, on Earth's habitability due because of the sun's evolution. Life has to start early. So the, so the fact that life did start early is not interesting. Maybe on most planets, life does not start early. It starts, you know, maybe after two billion years, three billion years, four billion years, fine, whatever. But that we're never going to be those, that's never going to be our origin story because they are never going to have enough time to become an intelligent people one day. There's just not enough time on the evolutionary clock. So there's a selection effect 
against against a against those late life starters. And the same way, there's a there's clearly a selection effect that we cannot live in a galaxy that's been that was colonized five billion years ago, because <laughs> otherwise there's no chance for us to exist in the first place. So it may right. very well it's, be you're sprinkling tree seeds in a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. So it, it is quite possible then that. 99% of galaxies around us have had that happen to them. And we necessarily would live in that rare case where it hadn't happened to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. And it may be ultimately our fate to engage in that activity down the road. So I think this, to me, is an argument to avoid the selection effect of doing more extragalactic SETI because that's decoupled from us. There's no relationship, unless you kind of really uh, get into like kind of interstellar, intergalactic propulsion, which is maybe stretching a little bit given what we think is possible. But you know, I'd say it's a it's certainly a more decoupled experiment from us. It's more independent from us. It has no bearing on us. And so I would be more interested in the results of looking at extragalactic SETI to some degree, because I think that could teach us um, it can provide a new window into solving this problem. So that was kind of my point in that video was let's not just, let's not conclude the universe is empty because our galaxy is empty. That's, that may be a condition to our existence, in fact. Right, right. Um, I mean, it, it, there are papers that have talked about like, what is the ideal solar system that, that in fact, like say our solar system with Jupiter and Saturn and all Kuiper belt objects and asteroid, all that, like that is not very efficient. That what's best is to dismantle all of the planets, put them into uh, orbits that are sort of nicely balanced, have them all orbiting around the sun in ways that are completely stable. And then you could just zip back and forth from habitable world to habitable world. You could multiply the amount of the population in the solar system by orders of magnitude. If you just rearranged the solar system in a better way, you could set up a supermassive black hole, like you mentioned earlier, have it orbited by a hundred other black holes. They're all orbited by stars. Mm. They're all orbited by planets. Like, like there is a more organized way that you could turn, you know, you could reshape a galaxy so that it is, is better for your, whatever yeah. your purpose is or like, and who yeah. knows, it may be worse for our purpose, but, but some advanced computer, you know, civilization thinks like this is what's best. Yeah. And, and we theoretically, you know, as we travel around planet Earth and we look at different cities and look at different approaches to the kinds, you know, what does a good port look like? How should schools be? What are good roads? Whatever. We see different approaches to the underlying, the same problems that we all face. And we would think that as we look out into the universe, into a wildly populated universe, we're going to see disparate civilizations, none of which can communicate with each other, approaching this challenge in their own unique way but we mm -hmm. just see wilderness. Yeah, I mean, every every galaxy looks, you know, to first order, remarkably similar to every other galaxy. You know, in terms of uh, it, imagining technology, certainly, we do not see um, giant machines or stars in a line or uh, like everything pushed towards the black hole. Every, everything, you know, can fully kind of make sense with Lambda CDM, which is, you know, which is interesting. It's, it's like when you do particle physics, you have the standard model and you look for interesting violations to it, which could be new particles and new physics. And obviously we're trying to do that in the same way, look for new physics, but we don't see any violations that would indicate a technological species. And I think that's that's interesting. And it, it bothers me. It really does bother me. And I it, think it should bother too. lots of people. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because I have this conversation with people and it doesn't bother them. And, and, yeah. And I and I feel like I'm just not making my my case well, right? Um, and you know, even what you said earlier on, you're like, well, maybe you know, you, you think about sort of the numbers game and the chances of things happening. But when you have a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way, when you have two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, you can run a lot of experiments. And so, even if you only get one percent making it through and going on to do something, or one one hundredth of one percent, or one one billionth. Of, it's still there's plenty of room to run those experiments at all, a, almost an infinite number of times, and we should be seeing the results of every one of those experiments or some of those experiments. And again, we just see wilderness. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's the biggest scientific puzzle I think, and that's why uh, you know JWST is exciting because it's giving us at least part of that answer potentially that maybe 
Uh, we can understand how common are atmospheres similar to Earth-like atmospheres. I don't think we're going to get biosignatures, to be honest, with, bias, with JST, but it's kind of chipping away in that Drake equation. And then hopefully with Aptal Worlds Observatory, we might get the biosignatures. And so all we can do it is kind of chip away at this problem. Um, but it's I think this problem is going to haunt us for hundreds of years still. I, I don't think we're we're on the on the breakthrough of figuring this out anytime soon, unfortunately. And I think that's the that's the change that's happened to me in the years that I've been doing this job. Is like I think you know when I think back and I was like, oh, as soon as a new like as soon as the Hubble Space Telescope detects oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet, done, we did it. Um, we've found life, and now we know that we're not alone in the universe. And now I know that that that's ridiculous. That that there's going to be so many arguments. And mm -hmm. so many competing opinions about what is a true biosignature. We saw what happened with the discovery of life on Mars, with the Viking experiment, yeah. with the Allen Hills meteorite, with methane, phosphine on Venus. And those are just places right here in the solar system. So um, be patient, I think. <laughs> it's the message yeah. that I have for people. And you know, if you really want to be patient and uh and I always say this, if we, if we, if you are like convinced you want to detect, you talk to aliens, like that's your life goal. You want to send a message to an alien and it be heard by an alien. I think there is a way that could be done. Uh, just maybe not the alien you're thinking of. And that's to set basically to build a time capsule. Cause you know, as I said, there's a, there's a billion years left on the clock for earth's habitability. And We've had, you know, you look at the the evolutionary adaptations that have happened on this planet, like photosynthesis, eukaryotes, sex, combogenesis, and these were major evolutionary transitions. But every time they happened, they didn't go away. Photosynthesis, you know, was invented two billion years ago, and it still persists. And that's because it has an enormous evolutionary advantage to manufacture your own food from sunlight. It's just obvious that that would be something you don't want to get rid of as a trait. In fact, life just got better and better at doing it. And so I kind of wonder in the same way whether intelligence might be a similar uh, evolutionary advantage that just doesn't go away on this planet, whatever happens to us. There are, it's not just us. You have, you know, octopuses, ravens, uh, humpback whales. There's intelligence across the animal kingdom, and none of that was here 500 million years ago. This is a fairly recent innovation. Even multicellular life is a fairly recent innovation. And so I kind of have a, a speculative hypothesis that, that intelligence will just is stubborn. It's like an infection. And now it's not that it's not that the the what Musk says, the um, the cradle of consciousness, whatever, the flame of consciousness, like this delicate thing. I think probably we'll screw ourselves over at some point and that'll be it. But I think to completely exterminate every human will be very difficult and to completely exterminate every trace of an intelligent um, evolutionary tra you know, trait in the, in the animal kingdom will be very, very difficult to do. And I suspect that, you know, this planet will, will have creatures on it one day who will be able to understand something about uh our civilization from clues that we might leave behind and so i'm i would be really excited to build something that could last a billion years that would be a tomb and a monument and a, a information store of who we were and the things that we learn and the way we thought about the universe and uh and i i suspect that is our best chance of ever having a message received. And it might not be a high chance. Maybe you might still give that a 10% chance, but I still think that's a better chance than uh, us hoping that Voyager 1 will be picked up by something one day. I think that's so extremely something, unlikely. Something monolith shaped put on the moon, for example. Exactly. 2001. Yeah. Let's just do a full space odyssey. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so you are an interesting person in the way you approach both the science that you do and the popularization and communication. And I, you know, often people sort of ask me for who I think are examples of people who are doing science communication right. And I pretty much start with you because, oh, you. because, well, because you do like good science, uh, you know, I think, um, from our reporting, <laughs> you know, we haven't had a lot of people tell us that your work is junk science. Um, okay. None, nobody but has some. told us this. So yeah, when I say not a lot, what I mean is none. Um, but you do the science and then you take this extra step, which is that you then figure out a way to communicate the science that you're doing to a public audience. And so 
and like I see that and I just like I like I'm really glad you're so busy because I would be out of a job if you were able to focus on the science communication side because you do the science so you've legit on that side and then you do a terrific job of actually explaining the science to a public audience so people can appreciate that why do you do this I enjoy it I mean I think sharing it's like why why do I teach you know when I go in the classroom and I teach the undergrads here at Columbia it just fills you up with energy to see them react and light up with these new revelations and new discoveries in their mind and the way they think about the world and as much as I've always enjoyed teaching and those kind of in-person classes and lectures and things as you know, you're only speaking to a tiny fraction of, of people. And so, of course, going online, doing it with social media is just a way to reach so many more people. I feel like it's almost the the most, um, what's the word, like philanthropic way of doing it, like the most selfless way. It sounds strange because people don't think of like social media as like the most selfish like type of people that tend to do it. I almost think of it the opposite way just because there's no... Um, you don't get that same kick as when you, when, if I give a public lecture, it's usually filled with astronomers who, you know, or amateur astronomers who just love astronomy and they'll come up to you and they'll talk your head off afterwards and they're just really into it. And I get really great energy off it and it's wonderful. Um, and obviously on social media, it's not like that at all. Like you'll get some great comments, but there's also just a ton of trash and, and hate comments as well. Whenever you do this kind of stuff. Um, and so it, you know, you're, you, you don't get that same positive, but at the same time, you know intellectually that you are hitting just a way, way bigger audience. And I just think about the fact that, you know, I was inspired by stuff I saw in, in mass media, especially like Star Trek. Growing up, I was a huge Star Trek fan. And, you know, I wanted to work with Geordie LaForge down in engineering and like figure out the warp drive and stuff like that. And so I just think like, you know, popular media and what we say in media has such a big influence on young people and uh, just a, and also just broader understanding in, in the public about how science works, that it's one of the most valuable things I can do. And so probably in a hundred years, no one will remember the guy who was looking for exomoons, but maybe uh, we might, you know, still feel the impact of the generations of astronomers that Sagan inspired to become interested in science because they train more scientists and they train more scientists. And even if Sagan's name is not remembered, the impact is very real in terms of the benefit to society. So I, yeah, I think it's one of the, um, the best things I can use my time to do. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I don't spend all my time doing it because I think having that balance, at least for me of research and psychom just keeps me sane. I think if I, I don't know, to be honest, how, you see so many YouTubers who have these, you know, recently, like the, the great retirement from YouTube and people packing it in because it is hard. It sounds like a great job, but after I've made a video, I do not want to touch video making for another week or two. I'm like, I'm done with this. I need a break. And fortunately I get to do that. There's a, I mean, there's a saying, I forget where it is. I think it's from like movies or whatever. It's like one for you, one for them and one for you. Right. So when you, when it comes to making videos, you do one, that is going to be a, appealing to a wide audience. And then you do one that's for yourself. And for me, the, the one for them is, is when I do the news updates and I kind of enjoy the question shows the news updates, you know, it's not necessarily the stories that I'm most interested in. The, the what's for me is these interviews like this, where I'm just mm. following my curiosity. I, I don't have to, you know, I'm able to sort of go at, at whatever pace I want to understand the information that I need to understand to do better reporting or whatever, but I'm really just following my curiosity. Um, yeah. And that, you know, if, you know, posting a new video and then you getting all of these negative comments and people eye rolling and giving you simplistic responses to things that, you know, you've thought very deeply about, it is hard to take day in, day out. And I can totally understand why people want to retire from, from this process. Hmm. but being able to kind of follow my curiosity and then kind of just going like, I don't care. Like, this is for me. This is not for you. And it's definitely not for the you that is coming in and eye rolling and um, you actually didn't watch the video, I know, and so on, right? Like, like it's, yeah. it's and it's for, the, it's for the, the silent people who are just like, yeah, 
I like what he's, what he's got to say. Uh, the other thing that I do for me is I talk to people, I talk to my patrons. So I actually invite every patron who joins me to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me because mm. it, it, it gives me a chance to get feedback about what I'm doing and so on. But also it's just a chance to talk to a person who is not the enraged you know, yeah. person who's already set to <laughs> disagree yeah. with you. It's a person who's just like a fan and they, you know, they've got really interesting insights and they're busy people working on important work. They're doctors, they're engineers, whatever. Yeah. And yet they have really interesting insights. And that for me, it just fills me up. Like it's just, I walk away from these going like, okay, everything's all right in the world. I can do more of this work and it feels okay. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's really important to get that balance because otherwise it can be really difficult and feel and and I think and so I guess for for you you know back to the very beginning that the audience that you're attempting to convince are the people on the steering committees at tell giving you telescope time does with, with your, one hat on with one hat with on. one yes yeah. yes yes with one hat on yeah. and and does the work that you do as a science communicator help that process in any way at all I don't know. I don't know if it helps or hinders it. Um, and I do think about that. And it's it's weird because there aren't there are some, but there aren't too many of us who walk both lines. And um, it is becoming a little bit more common. But uh, I always find it so strange when I go to a conference and an astronomer says to me, "Oh, I really loved your videos," and I feel weird that they saw them. Like. It's because I, I didn't make that video for astronomers, but of course it's inevitable that they would stumble across it because they're obviously interested in astronomy because that's their profession. So maybe they don't spend all their time watching astronomy videos, but they've probably come across it now and again. And it's always weird to me because I, I, in my head, I keep those things almost totally like separate audiences and separate universes that don't interact. And I never like, I would never give a colloquium and say, by the way, it goes to my YouTube channel. Like it's just like, it's like a Sign separate. Sign up to my Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a separate thing. But um, and I don't have a good sense as to whether it's a positive or, or a negative. I think you could see it kind of going either way. But I do think, I mean, with JWST, it probably is irrelevant because a lot of the proposals are anonymous. Um, certainly JWST was anonymous. So in principle, it should be, uh, they should have no idea who I am. But I guess the problem is there's not that many people who work on that. Yeah, there's so a team maybe. of researchers asking for JWST <laughs> time to find excellence. I wonder who it could be. <laughs> there are right. some others, but there's not, okay, okay. There's maybe not that many. So uh, I, I don't know. And maybe maybe that's, that's seen as a problem because I obviously talk about exomoons and I love, you know, I'm on here talking about exomoons and these proposals and stuff. And so I, it, it's weird that these two worlds mix for me. I'm still kind of, figuring it out, like how, how it all makes sense. But I do think, you know, one amazing thing has been from our patrons, uh, they support my research team. And so I didn't really see a penny of it directly. It just all goes to like supporting students and, you know, computers and stuff and paper charges and stuff that we need to get our research done. And that's been amazing because it's not tied to a grant. So normally when you write a grant, it's like, I'm going to do X. And Frankly, the risk appetite, as I think has been obvious from this conversation, is quite low amongst most funding bodies. And so it has allowed me and my team to uh, support students on more more out there projects, you know, more stuff that maybe would be harder to fund. And so we, one, you know, we've been working on the telescope that we talked about earlier before we got started on this conversation. Um, we've been working on uh, a new interstellar propulsion system recently in my team, which again has been funded by patrons. So this is the kind of stuff I can never write a grammar post and say, I've got I've got this crazy idea from the side of propulsion system, will you fund me? They'll just say, get out of here. Like, but but having that ability to um, have that support has been amazing. And also it I think it has made me a much better communicator and scientist in general because I am you know what it's like. You're an expert essentially in everything. Fraser, you're, you're reading papers on galaxies, exoplanets, um, big bang, like every, interstellar medium, everything. And so when you're doing science communication, you're forced to like ingest everything. Whereas I think the natural temptation in academia these days is just to go like really super narrow and just totally lose sight of what your colleagues are doing. And I've 
I think I've become a much better scientist because it's forced me to engage and get inspired by other people more. Well, and I wonder about that with like your, say you put up a new video and then you get a bunch of responses from people. Obviously some of them, you know, they just haven't thought about it very deeply, but I'm sure there are really well thought through responses to the stuff. It is almost like peer review. D- yeah. Does does some of it come across that way, and then it makes you helps you sharpen your thinking about future iterations of your ideas? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's been some really interesting ideas that have been born from comment sections of my videos, and um, I think like one was I, know, I think one like a long time ago was why are there no green stars or something? Somebody asked that in the comment section of my YouTube video. I hadn't really thought about that before. And then I you know, looked into it and I made a video about it and it was actually really interesting. And then we actually started a research project last summer that's actually kind of resolving this. And so it turns out it is basically physically impossible to ever have a green star, at least green in, in the narrow band that our eyes would call green. And so that made us think, well, what other things were impossible? And so we started a project that's looking for impossible stars, stars which just their colors are not possible. You can take the colors in the Kepler band, the two mass band, all these different instruments and see, are there combinations of colors that just should never happen? Even if you combine three or four stars together, they should just never make these types of colors. And so that's been one of our ways to look for techno signatures is essentially to look for impossible stars. So, you know, that whole thread from uh, the 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 idea for the YouTube video was spawned from a previous comment, and then all the way to a research project was followed through by the enthusiasm people had about that that video. You know that just goes to show you that the they are they they live in in a overlapping space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the the other thing that I find for me anyway, once I started to do a lot of the the question shows, a lot of the stuff that I do live to an audience. And it's, even now it's, it's completely un like, I don't know what the questions are going to be. And it's just mm. a matter of trying to jam as much knowledge into my head so that I can be ready for anything with precision. You know, I can try to tell you that yeah. the, you know, the radio velocity of an earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star is going to be 50 centimeters per second. Right. Like, like those are the kinds of numbers that, I don't know if that right. Yeah. Anyway, um, that you need to be, to be able to sort of like also have that information. It's been immensely valuable not only for my writing, because I can just, like, I have this sort of working piece of the universe in my brain that I can draw upon nonstop. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also just like really great when I can talk to somebody like you or a researcher and I can kind of go, oh, well, did you hear about this thing over there? And like, I hadn't even heard about that thing over there. Yeah. And you mentioned this idea that people are siloed deeply. How do you think about kind of cross disciplines? How can we get more people who are working in different fields to be able to share that knowledge and come together with each other? That's a great question. I think the whole of academia, certainly in STEM, has been trying to wrap, grapple with that question. There have been programs, we have programs like this on campus, and I think there's nationally, where there's like joint funding, where they basically force you, right? They say, you're only getting money if you collaborate with someone in a completely different department. And that's the only way you're getting grant money. And um, I've done, I have you know I've engaged in those kind of grants before. We did a, a, uh, an idea on planetary linguistics. After I saw Arrival, I had a, got inspired by Arrival with linguistics. And I got in contact with a linguist and we came up with a cool project together trying to apply that to exoplanet patterns um and so that that can be that can be partially successful but i think it's been hurt a lot recently just because of covid and the whole everyone going virtual it's only exacerbated it and we've you know i think the best ideas come from meeting people and talking and so just uh, a few days ago um downtown we had um an exo nyc event it was called at the Flatiron institute but that jim simons uh, sponsors and so it's crazy, but for the last, you know, there's probably 50 people went to this event, all in New York City, all working on exoplanets. So we work on the same thing. And I didn't know like nine out of 10 people in that room and no one else did. None of us knew each other. <laughs> we're all in the same place doing the same thing. And so, you know, why, and we're all like, why haven't we, what's going on? Like, why don't we know about each other? And so there just is no in-person events, obviously for the last few years. And it's really hurt. Um, our ability to collaborate, even within the field, let alone uh, getting to worrying about other fields. And so uh, this event was great because it just gave us an opportunity to uh, bounce ideas around and actually start new collaborations together, which two started for me in that meeting. 
Um, so I think just it's 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 like a real conflict in my head because I don't want to go to conferences in Hawaii and New Zealand because like the carbon footprint is so terrifyingly huge. It feels like a really unethical and irresponsible thing to do. But at the same time, if we talk to each other on Zoom, it's just not the same. And it's not the same as having uh, 20 brilliant astronomers in a room trying to crack a problem together. And in an hour, they'll solve something that would otherwise just be on Overleaf or on Slack for, for like <laughs> two years without going anywhere. Yeah, I think this worked really well for me is when I finish an interview, I will ask them for some recommendations for people to interview next. And mm -hmm. I'm looking for people who are well-spoken, who but who are creative and thinking about, you know, if that's what I need for what I'm doing is I need people who are yeah. like very creative, kind of out of the box thinking, who are cross-discipline and can weave a really compelling narrative that is going to interest me and my audience. But <clears throat> but I think in that moment when you find somebody who is interesting in doing work, they probably know other people that are really interesting. And I don't think that we can just rely on the happenstance that you once could when we were all in physical proximity to each other and you're at a at a uh, cocktail party at the you know the American Astronomical Society. Oh, what do you do? Yeah. Oh, I do this. Oh, what do you do? I do that. Oh my God, that's what I do. And and then, but it's different from what we do. And then we should talk after and you hand each other cards. Like like yeah. those opportunities have disappeared. But yeah. we can be, I think, very purposeful about it and sort of add that into our routine to say constantly be bringing new people into my orbit that I can have these kinds of interactions with. And you never know. Um, some of the most fascinating conversations that I've had, you know, the audience doesn't yeah. even know which of them they have yeah. been, have been a referral yeah. from somebody. I'm like, give me the three names for the people who you re like respect the most. And I think yeah. the other thing is, is that there is this entirely new audience that is constantly coming in or new new researchers. Like they're they're coming through the graduate program, they're just getting their first work, they're doing collaborations with other people. They don't really they don't have a big name for themselves yet. And yet they're they're the ones who are on the cutting edge of this of this work. And it's yeah. it's always the emphasis placed on the people who have been doing this for 30 years and are at the head of the department and have some, you know, cool world's lab uh, that they can <laughs> be associated with, right? But but you know, I mean, so many of the people who you've worked with have gone on to be stars of their own, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, Moy McTeer. I mean, there's just like so many amazing people you've worked with. And I yeah, think that yeah. that encouragement from you to get out there, to publicize what you're working on, to find connections and collaborations is, is key. So I don't know. I mean, is there a, a way to... As a researcher, as a part, you know, we would sort of give advice to a new, someone who's like new in the field on how to make connections and how to find those collaborations. What would you do? Yeah. I mean, normally I tell my students, I mean, one thing is that I think is not, we always have to fight for as professors to get our students to do. And it's not a social thing, but it kind of leads to those social connections is just reading papers and reading what we call the archive. So every day there's new papers appearing on the archive. I'm sure you're well familiar with it. And there's, you know, when I was a student, I was always in the practice of just reading the archive every day, every day, every day. And it, that that is kind of a conversation. It's just a very um, uh, long latency conversation that happens between academics. And so how can you join the conversation if you're not listening to what other people are saying? If there's a circle of people and you're not listening to what they say. You can't just really butt in to say, well, what about this? And they're like, Who, who's this guy? <laughs> like you, you have to actually listen to what other people are saying before you can join the conversation. Um, and then that really equips you so that when you do meet these people, and you will meet these people, um, you actually you know, you have an understanding of where they're coming from and their work and possible connections to your own thing. So I think, you know, just that kind of diligent prep of like being well read as corny as it sounds is extremely important in productive research conversations. Um, and I think, you know, my favorite examples of in truly interdisciplinary science have been at SETI meetings. And in those cases, you get anthropologists, historians, theologians, astronomers, of course, but astronomers also from many different branches from like doing optical laser SETI to radio astronomy. And so those are, those are really interesting meetings because nobody talks the same language. And so we all have to kind of find a common language during those meetings that we can, 
actually have productive, you know, scientific discussions with one another. And uh, those have always been, when I leave those meetings, I'm always like, wow, that was, that was awesome. Like I have so many ideas and new connections. Um, so I think SETI is actually a really great model, I think, for how to do that. And it's kind of a shame that when you go to AAS, it almost feels uh, very siloed that there's exoplanet sessions and not just exoplanet sessions, but exoplanet atmosphere sessions and not even just exoplanet atmosphere sessions, but, you know, ex- temperature pressure profile sessions. Right. Probably like, Hot it Jupiter. gets extremely yeah, yeah, yeah. narrow and you can just spend your whole week not hearing anything but exoplanet atmosphere yeah. talks. And that that's probably not that helpful, even though it's maybe tempting to do that. I don't think that's the most constructive thing. And is that partly just because SETI is still like a ragtag collection of misfits? Like <laughs> probably, like, yeah. Like can I can I get a PhD in techno signatures right now? Yes. Yeah, you can. Oh, I can. Uh, okay, like, I can. Yeah, like I Sophia Shake uh, recently at uh, Penn State uh, graduated with a with a PhD in SETI. Yeah. Okay. All right. Could I, yeah. what about searching for say, uh, Kardashev civilizations, extragalactic Kardashev civilizations? Would I be able to get my PhD in that? I, th- I think your thesis could be on anything within the field of techno signatures and, and be passable. I think the, the subject matter is not, um, allergic, you know, there's no, uh, reason why you can't do a thesis on that. There was a, the thesis talk I heard yesterday was on looking for Dyson spheres. And the yep. whole thesis was about looking for Dyson spheres in um, Gaia and two mass data. So I, I certainly think you can write your thesis about whatever you want. It might hurt your job prospects. That's right. Know, that's that's a different conversation. But um, there's well, no, let's I have think, that though. Like, like does it does it hurt your job? But like, still, if you say I'm the best in the world at searching for evidence of giant civilizations reshaping their galaxies mm-hmm. over the cosmic horizon. Can it job please? What's yeah? That's how is that I've, received? I've, I've never seen. I, I think I certainly think as a postdoc, um, you could you could make that work. Um, it is a shame, and it's not like I'm endorsing this or anything. But I think it is probably factually true that amongst faculty hires, so professorships, um, I don't remember ever seeing even on a short list somebody who was an out and out. SETI person, at least at least in recent memory, but I, maybe people know of counterexamples, but it's extremely rare. I mean, we're doing a faculty search here at Columbia right now. We have seven brilliant people, but I can tell you, uh, it, we didn't even get a single application from anyone who wants to do tennis signatures. So either either it's because, you know, there isn't a supply or they, you know, postdocs feel that's not the right direction, but it doesn't appear, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't end up in the final product that you end up with many uh, SETI faculty out there. And I think probably the reason is because there just isn't much funding at the end of the day. And so as a postdoc, it's like a, a barren desert, right? That's one of the ways you get a faculty job is to say, like, I've won all of this grant money, but what do you do if there's just no grant money available in the first place? Um, and so that's why there are so many people who do exoplanet atmospheres, because that's there's just a colossal amount of research funding being poured into that at the moment. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I used to think about this with exomoons. I tell my students, like, there's not many people doing exomoons, and so there's not much research money for it. But at the same time, that's kind of appealing to me because uh, it's easier to get your name known and to establish uh, yourself in a career. So it's it's a double-edged sword a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah to but I be d- outside I th- I think, of the tradition. I think if you want to change it, you just create research grants. That's, that's probably, you know, the solution. Okay. And I know there are obviously private foundations like Breakthrough Listen, which are pouring lots of money into SETI, but they generally don't create, you know, open core research grants that a postdoc in Missouri can support themselves from in, you know, different institutes. So that's probably what you need, I think, if you were going to truly generationally change the situation. David, what are you obsessed with right now? Many things. I think fla- I think there's a blatantness thing. Uh, I, I just had a really great meeting with my students, so it's always like very fresh. Like what's you know what's in my head. So we are really excited about uh, you know being able to detect these blatantness signals of exoplanets for the first time, and we've been putting in a huge amount of work into writing this algorithm which can do this super fast and scan through thousands of planets at once and this really hasn't been done in any kind of scale yet so that that's very exciting to me to to kind of break through that that problem and i think you know with jwst it's just um what i 
I'm, I'm so amazed by the quality of the data. It is absolutely stunning what this telescope is doing. And so far, the targets have not been my favorite targets. Obviously, it's been staring at TRAPPIST-1 a ton, which I think we're all excited about at first. And now maybe we're thinking, maybe we should look at other targets at this point. So I, I, the actual capabilities of the telescope are great. Um, and I'm hoping that we get uh, some more diverse targets coming out from JWST because that that is just a total game changer in terms of the capabilities mm-hmm. that it's giving us. It is sort of, it does seem to sort of simultaneously be arriving at a time when the only kind of Earth-sized worlds orbiting around stars are looking less and less habitable. Yeah. Like the Trappist, yeah. Trappist B and C airless. Um, there was a paper that just came out. Someone did the math on the rest of the Trappist planets and they and said there's, they should have all lost their atmospheres in the first hundred million years. Like, yeah. It's not looking that, good. It's not looking good for red dwarf planets, you know, at all, any of them, that mm-hmm. any planet that would be in the habitable zone is also going to be this radiation baked atmosphere stripped hellscape and yeah and these are the this is the few type of planets that can be observed yeah which sucks I, it it sucks but i think it was still worth doing the experiment and i think even yes. though there was theoretical expectations that red dwarfs might not be the best place it's definitely worth looking but if if you have a, a literally an atmosphereless planet i think we're, we're kind of done right we, we can probably move on at this point and and look at other objects and i also just think you know we can't put all of our eggs in the basket of red dwarfs, which I think is tempting to do because they have so many advantages in terms of signal to noise. But, um, you know, there's an obvious, there's an obvious goal and that's earth like planets around sun like stars, because we know for sure that that's that at least in some cases is right. capable of going in all the way. One case. Uh, yeah. Well, three, so, three, fine. Three <laughs> cases, right? Well, Venus, all the way to earth life, and one Mars. case. Yeah. And yeah. one all yeah. the way to life in one case. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, in one of the, one of the still giant questions is, is, is that true earth twin question? And, uh, we're, you know, we're thinking really hard about that in my team as well, like from the statistics of what we know and what we can do. I think moons play a big role in that whole question as well. I mean, with HWO, that's, that's a lot in our minds at the moment. Like what does the Habitable Worlds Observatory, the successor to James Webb, what does that need to look like? Like what, what are its necessary capabilities to, to resolve some of these questions? Um, and moons are really important. For instance, as we talked about with a pale bluish gray dot, if you don't have a way to figure out there's a moon there, you're going to get a spectrum that is a mixture of two worlds or even more than that potentially. And then you've got something like Titan, which is methane rich, and you could have a water world with no life on it that then produces tons of oxygen through photolysis in the atmosphere when UV light splits up water. And now that is the perfect biosignature. So you've got this, this complete false positive. And if we if we do not tread carefully on this problem, we're gonna we're gonna walk into just ambiguity. So we are we're thinking a lot about how do we design these experiments to to really resolve this question and it's it's hard but it's it's the ultimate question so it's an exciting time to be involved in that yeah it feels like the theme for you right now is false positives yeah that's that's certainly in my head a lot anyway i love statistics yeah. so i kind of love falling into those problems where you can you can write down one of the papers i'm working on right now is is thinking about um clustering as a solution to this and so if you if you were looking for a dyson sphere this is kind of my and I pitched you about why this might work. If you're looking for a Dyson sphere, which is to say an infrared excess, it's a star which produces too much infrared light and not enough optical light, then the immediate challenge whenever you get these candidates is, well, what if it's just a dusty star? How do you know it's not just a dusty star there? Um, so one way around that, that's your false positive. You'd have to somehow know the false positive rate, but of course we don't know the false positive rate. So how, how do you even make sense of this? But one way around this might be to look at clustering. So if you had... Uh, five or six stars that were co-located, but you know there's no gas between them. You know there's no dust between them because you have the ability to sense you know, things from the background coming through. Let, you, know, you can do ray tracing and see there's nothing between them. But then you notice that on all six, and they're not just located in the sky together, they're 3D located together. 
And if all six of those show the same signature, even though you don't know the false positive rate, you can prove that the chance of that happening coincidentally is just astronomically small, given that there's, you know, so you can use the, the, uh, the spatial clustering of these signatures to potentially get around this false positive rate. So I'm working on a paper right now that tries to rigorously prove that and show that this might be a best bet to look for not just um, a planet with, hab with habitable conditions and biosignatures, but maybe a whole chain. So if you had three planets that you know were all in the habitable zone and all three of them show the, the biosignature pairings that you expect, then even though you don't know the false positive rate in general for planets, the, the co-location of that makes it extremely unlikely that this is just a pure coincidence. Yeah, the, so the comparative. Be, yeah, and th that's really interesting, this idea of like kind of comparative geology, I don't know, atmospherics yeah. between those worlds, looking them in situ with the rest of the planets in that system, gives you so much more information, statistically speaking, because you could have worlds that are too close, too far, and yet they have this exact same atmospheric composition. Yeah. That's shocking and surprising. So I want to close this up. I have a, I have a homework question for, for you to okay. hand out to your students, um, okay. which is how big would a Dyson sphere have to be so that the heat signature, the infrared signature that it's giving off is statistically indistinguishable from the cosmic microwave background so that the civilization can mm. hide. Yeah. How big would it have to be? Because yeah. I, I get this comment all the time from people who are like, oh, well, you just, you know, you just put it in layers and you each point you extract a little more radiation and eventually the outest shell is indistinguishable from the cosmic microwave and you have hidden your star. How big does your Dyson sphere have to be so that you can effectively hide your star? My, my immediate reaction would be infinity or basically it's, it's an, an impossible because it's always going to be in thermal. The best it could ever do is be in thermal equilibrium with the CMB. Yeah. So it would have to be, you know, some level of sigma where the- So uh, any, the, any, any size will mean it gets more radiation from the star than it does from the CMB. So it almost has to tend towards infinity. It would be my guess, but that'd be fun. We, I'm running a graduate seminar all about technical signatures this, yeah, this yeah. semester. So that would be a great- so you could find out, like, up. what would it take to hide your stars? Because there could be entire galaxies, but uh, you know, like, like it's in light years was the yeah. was the number that I came up with. But okay. but it'd be interesting to see what you know, sort of what is a, a way to sort of completely rule out if you really want to hide your star. Here's how big you'd have to make it. Yeah, I like it. That's a fun right. remote question. Yeah, I figured. We'll see what they come right. with. <laughs> well, Dave, it's been a pleasure. I hope we don't wait another four years before we talk again. Um, but yeah. I think you guys are doing a great job and good luck. Let me know after we post this video live, when you get that time on JWST to search for that oblate spheroid out there orbiting other star. And the exit, mean. And what? <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody wants that exit. Mean. It's really, it's about the shape of the world. I, you might as well just throw that extra data out. All right. We'll see you in All four right. years for the next time. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye, Fraser. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. David Kipping. Now I'm going to give you some thoughts and feedback and other resources. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twilight, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ganstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, and Josh Schultz and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. As I mentioned in the interview, I think David is one example of a science communicator who is both doing legitimate science work, but also doing an excellent job of being able to communicate that work out to a wider public audience. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people that follow their channel. The videos can get hundreds of thousands of views. Uh, it's very popular and it can lead to very interesting conversations on the channel. And, and I really think that like it is taxing for scientists to both do the science work, but then also try and make the work that they do accessible to a wider audience. But it does ground you. It does help. When I, when I think about all the people who I've interviewed, the ones who are both scientists and take that extra work to try and communicate the, what they're doing to an audience, like Carl Sagan, right? I'm not that I interviewed Carl Sagan. That would be amazing. But people like Carl Sagan who recognize that the two things are important. You can't just do the work, 
you have to be able to explain it to the public. That's where the funding comes from. And as you hear that feedback and as you talk to other people, then you can bring that in and roll into what you're doing and hopefully do better work that is more transparent and more aligns with sort of how you feel this conversation is un, you know, unrolling going forward. So I think David is the best, um, but I think for people who are thinking about how do I get into more science communication? You know, if you're a scientist, but you also want to try and tell your story to the public, uh, you couldn't have a better example to follow than David Kipping. So uh, now I've done several interviews with David, but here's the one that we mentioned at the last Astronomical Society meeting. So check out this interview with Dr. David Kipping.